Good morning, everyone from IIT Gandhinagar. We are very happy to have today Dr. Anuradha Chaudhary with us to continue our explorations on living traditions of Sanskrit, which have already taken us through quite a bit of literature and other aspects, not in themselves, not the classical traditions of them, but the manner in which they are still present today in India, either through nomenclatures or through concepts or through lingering traditions of all kinds. So, Dr. Anuradha is a well-known proponent of Sanskrit learning, Sanskrit teaching. She is, first of all, a Sanskrit teacher at IIT Kharagpur, but she has also been involved in many attempts to popularize Sanskrit, in particular Sanskrit as a spoken language, uh, about which I think we will hear more tomorrow. So I will not read out uh, all her uh, distinctions and qualifications. They are on our website, uh, iks.itgn.ac.in. Uh, I will uh, simply say that I have had the pleasure to know her for a long time and to see her dedication and hard work towards uh, these cultural uh, traditions and especially Sanskrit centered, although she's also gifted in several other languages. So with this brief introduction, uh, I will request Dr. Anuradha to start her presentation uh, today and it will continue tomorrow, as you can see on our website again. Thank you. Namaste <clears throat> and uh, thank you very much. Uh, Michelle, for giving me this opportunity to, uh, you know, address a very knowledgeable gathering also, and who've been passionate about the whole cause of Indian knowledge systems, and um, now looking at the role of Sanskrit in uh, uh, promoting it and upholding this knowledge tradition. So as uh, very typical to our tradition, I'd just like to start with a small invocation. I ask to be excused for my broken voice a little bit. I'll try my best. But for some reason, if I'm not audible, uh, if I'm not clear, please please feel free to um, interrupt me and ask me questions. I will also try and make this session a little interactive in certain places. So please feel free to uh, answer. I would really look forward to listening to your thoughts on some points that I might raise. So just a small invocation. Oh, Shanno Mitra Shamvarunaha, Shanno Bhavatvaryama, Shanna Indro Brihaspatihi, Shanno Vishnu Rurukramaha, Namo Brahmane, Namaste Vayo, Vameva Pratyaksham Brahmasi, Vameva Pratyaksham Brahma Vadishami, Pritam Vadishami, Satyam Vadishami, Tanma Mavatu, Tad Vaktara Mavatu, Avatumam, Avatu Vaktaram, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. So, um, you've been looking at certain aspects of Sanskrit so far. I will be talking to you about the uh, my experience by engaging with Sanskrit and what I've discovered with what Sanskrit has to offer to us as people. So, primarily, normally when we use language, we believe that we are shapers of the language, as I wrote in my abstract. But what we also seldom think about is the extent to which language plays a key role in shaping our thinking and shaping the way we look at the world. So I'll just uh, maybe start with a few questions initially. Can you all see the screen clearly enough? Like I won't do a full screen because I want to write some things. So. Yes, your screen is visible. Thank you. Yes. 
So let's start with some fundamental questions right about language itself. First of all, what is language really? So I'd love to hear a few thoughts from you and then I'll proceed on that. What is language? Tool for communication. Tool for communication, perfect. So, when we talk of tool for communication, we realize that somebody's mic is on. Yeah, Sriramji, can you just put off your mic? Thank you. So what we realize is that when we say it's a tool for communication, it means that there are certain thoughts in my head that through a particular articulation of sounds, I'm able to uh, create the uh, similar image into your minds. So it's being able to communicate. And the more effectively it does that, the smarter the language is in a sense. So in the minimum number of words, the maximum impact it creates uh, also results in determining how smart a language is. It also, of course, depends on the skill of the speaker. So there are many factors involved in that. All right, something else? What else is language? DD. Sorry? Uh, it's a um, way to store uh, knowledge and information and Absolutely. different traditions uh, in the form of knowledge, uh, in the form of langu language. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, way to store information, I would say. Uh, would you like to specify it further a little bit or just information in generically information, but in certain contexts, what does it become as well? Uh, every knowledge field has its uh, terminology. And uh, so people in this field, they agree upon this terminology. And in this way, they can uh, communicate better and they can also write uh, papers and books uh, with the help of this terminology. Okay, so there is a, can I put it as, you know, so there are terminologies that are specific um so let's say collection of specific worldviews can i say it like that in a sense worldviews yes. through terminologies rather than collection representation of worldviews through specific terminologies. Hmm. All right. Anybody else might would want to add anything else? We Thank you for two, that. We have two suggestions from the chat box. Yes. One is a means of apprehending and expressing reality. Okay. So it is a uh, it is a representation of reality. Let's say. Yes. It ties in a little bit to the representation of worldviews, but I'll put it as a separate thing. Yes, anything else? Another is to express thoughts, actions, emotions in a specific way, which is understood by many and has a common acceptance. Yes. So it can be a, a vehicle of thoughts, actions, emotions. We can say a, a carrier of, so an, uh, a carrier tool of communication. It can be a Carrier of um, thoughts, thoughts, action, emotions. emotions. Yeah. Actions right. of emotions. All right. And is there anybody else who has a burning uh, thing to add here? Uh, so it should be like language should have some sort of structure otherwise like if i am doing some sign another person is doing some sign so it should have some sort of structure in its words and sure okay so language uh, i would say i will I'll, I'll, I'll just simplify it and say language is a, a structured communication i'll just put it out here structured communication having Grammar. 
I mean, we can also, there, there are, I mean, there are a lot of nuances in all of these things that we're saying, but just to keep it simple, I leave it there. Because we can even say that if there is no structured grammar, uh, is, it, is, is it not language? Um, you know, the difference between written language, oral language, sign language, um, indication. In fact, the whole of the Mimamsa Shastra has a very detailed exploration about where really lies the power of the intention of the communicator. Is it in the entire sentence? Is it in the word? Is it in the action? So they give this example, a brilliant example. I mean, uh, so they say that, you know, if somebody walks into the door, I can say, close the door. And this is the complete grammatical sentence that has been uttered. And the other person understands. It was a communication in a structured grammatical format. They say, what if somebody walks in through the door and somebody says, the door. One still understands. There has been the use of language uh, through articulation and the other person understands the intent of the speaker. Uh, they push it even further. So the question is, where really lies the power of what one wants to communicate? You can push it one step further. And then if the person says, if somebody walks in through the door and you just do, you know, you don't even articulate anything, but you just with the eyes indicate that, the other person gets it. Uh, and then, so communication has happened without the use of uh, articulated words. There has been a sign language, but meaning has passed. We have like very, very advanced cases where, you know, in the cases of certain spiritual masters, uh, you know, the two masters have met, not a word has been exchanged between them. And yet when they've gone back, their answers, I mean, they've, they've had a certain communication. In fact, this has happened to a lot of um, students, disciples who have gone to their masters. They had, they came with certain questions. They sat there. Uh, there was no question that was asked. There was no answer that was uttered. And yet the student went back with their answers got. Uh, in fact, in the Dakshinamurti Stotra, it is said, um, Maunam Vyakhyanam. And then the Gurustu Maunam Vyakhyanam. So the Guru is doesn't even say anything. And the Chatra, they've got Chinna Samshayaha. Their doubts have been cleared. So it's it's a fascinating domain of you know, this entire thing of what really is communication about and where is it going and what are all the factors that lead to, um, you know, precise communication. But as you've mentioned, that when one is using language and one is using articulated, articulated words, then if one is not very grammatical, the meaning might be understood, but the more grammatically formulated, more correctly grammatically formulated the sentences, the more powerfully content is explained and understood. So absolutely, what everything that has been said here adds to the different shades of effective communication using language and language is a tool for that. Thank you for that. Yes, so fine, I will continue. Thank you all, that was very helpful. Um, so we basically see also that it is, uh, as we've seen the tool for communication, which is way to store information. I will just add a little bit here, but to store information and uh, document, document cultural knowledge systems, um, knowledge systems. So that's just an added dimension to that. Representations of worldview through specific terminologies. Therefore, this particular aspect raises all the questions about translations. If you're translating from one language to another, what is communicated, what is lost, what is retained? Big questions. Uh, to communicate one word, do you need many words in the other languages? And therefore the loss of a language uh, is if communication alone is what is important. then if one language is no longer spoken, uh, what happens really? Is it a loss of a worldview? Is it a loss or, or so long as those ideas exist, one can still, it doesn't matter if languages die out. In a world today where we are more and more getting monopolized, you know, homogenized with the English language, uh, let's say in India also, in Bharat also, all the uh, regional languages are in danger because there's so much of intermixing of English into the regional languages as well. So language purity, how important is it to retain language purity versus a mixing of language? Many, many questions that, you know, that arise when we are taking language and its aspects into consideration. And then of course, it is a 
a representation of a reality again the language death question comes in here so if a language dies then uh, is there a loss of reality complete loss of reality uh, so in this context i can just mention like in some tribal regions they've got some 30 40 30 40 words for bamboo because they've got that many usages of bamboo uh, so if you don't have that language at all other cultures that don't use bamboo so much will never appreciate the different shades in which this particular natural resource could be used could be benefited from similarly the uh, the uh, the eskimos they have about 40 words or more for ice because the, their life depends on the nature of and their interaction uh, with the kind that they have to live with. So some ice, if they have a particular word with it, would indicate it's too thin that you can't walk upon it. And other ice means it's solid enough that you can build something on it. If that shade of word was not there, it can literally endanger somebody's life in a particular context. So that's very important. And we see, of course, that it is a career carrier of thoughts, emotions, uh, and actions. Uh, so we, we can go on. Now, another way of looking at it is that language is also, the story of origins of language is also uh, the story of sounds and vibrations, because ultimately, language is sounds and vibrations, uh, very much so. So uh, I make a few, I, I articulate a sound, that creates certain vibrations in the atmosphere, which then vibrates into your ear, um, you know, the ear into your ears, and then that creates a certain vibration and creates a comprehension. So that's another way also of looking at it. But I'll talk a little more about it when we come to Sanskrit to say why this language is also known as Apaurusheya. I mean, I have my own theory to that that I'll try and present before you. A role of language is something that we've already looked at. So one of the ways of looking at the role of language is that it was a doorway to grasp reality, as you've said. So there is an external component and there is an internal component. And the external component has characteristics as well as there is content for both the external and the internal. When we talk of the external components, then the questions that come up is what can we do with language? And I've, in my own way, tried to put it into this way of looking at, uh, you know, categorizing of our life, which talks about there is an aspect of apara uh, or that which is outside, that which is to do with information, etc. And there is an aspect that is known as para, which is to do with the human instrumentation. Uh, this is a, a classification that is done when we talk of knowledge. Knowledge is considered to be of two kinds. There is an apara knowledge and vidya, specifically apara vidya and para vidya. So when we are talking of apara vidya, we are talking of knowledge that has to do with the external world, uh, everything to do with information, how to make things work, skills, etc. But then we talk of a para vidya, which has to do with the knowledge of the highest, really. But it, it one can arrive at that knowledge of the highest by working on the human instrumentation. So there is an impact of knowledge or of vidya on the inner instrumentation that makes it fine enough, refines it to become capable of greater experience and expression. Okay, so these are two parts. At any point, if what I'm saying is not so clear, please feel free to interrupt and ask. And therefore, what is Sanskrit? Very literally, it uh, as I'm sure you would have heard earlier on, so Sanskrit literally means samyak kritam or well done. Uh, it can mean put together, well formed, perfected. Kritam coming from the root kr, which is also the root of karma, karya, karta. You have got tons of words on you know that are derivatives of this root. But samyak means well and kritam means done. So what do we mean by saying that a language is well done? I'm curious to hear what you understand just by this epithet almost, uh, which is also the nomen the name for the word language. So what do you understand? When somebody says a language is well done, what does that really mean? There is no ambiguity. The grammar is perfected. The grammar is perfected. Wonderful. Anything else? Grammar is one stage of it. Anything else before that? 
or the sound the sound of sanskrit itself is good for the health uh, for the our, it, it works on our prana it works on our prana and therefore it is considered good if it's, if sanskrit is spoken well it is like uh, actually performing a breathing exercise ah wonderful yes absolutely well, i'll explain it further for those who might not have exactly got the logic there yes please could it be also that uh, sanskrit is in harmony with the sanskritic culture so uh, things are expressed in such a way in sanskrit that it is harmonic with the vedic culture and also um, yeah just like that wonderful absolutely that could also be another dimension and another thing here i want to ask you is that normally the different languages that we know of what is the basis of their naming what is the basis of the names that other languages get usually on what basis do we call a language by a name uh, by the area it is spoken most commonly by the area where it is spoken or by the community that speaks it Uh, so it is either related to the geography or to the community, the cultural dimension of it. This is one language which got a name like Sanskrit, and uh, it has some other names like Deva Bhasha as well, which is the language of the gods. But that is a simplistic way of looking at that particular word. But Deva also comes from the root Div, uh, which means divine, uh, mm -hmm. but which literally means illumined. So this language is a language of illuminations, or it has illuminations within the language. You know what does that mean? Again, questions that one can ask around the language. But what is remarkable is, of course, that it is not associated with one people, one place. But it's so beautifully perfected in its own format that one could not but refrain from calling it Sanskritam. Okay, that is that. Fine. Just basic questions around it. What is the history of it? So they very, very conservatively, 3000 BC, the oldest texts that we find in Sanskrit are the Vedic texts. And uh, they are dated around anywhere between 3000 to 600 BC. Classical Sanskrit started more or became more uh, recognized from the time of Panini when he set up, his, when he wrote his Ashtadhyayi. From then onwards, the systematization of the language happened more so. And classical language took over from there. So this is, uh, these are two kinds of periods uh, and the Sanskrit language itself has largely uh, this kind of nature of a Vedic Sanskrit and then the classical Sanskrit. So one of the uh, features about Vedic Sanskrit is that they refer to it as a, they call it the, uh, they call it an apaurushya. The Vedas itself are known as apaurushya. That means they are not, they, it hasn't come, the Vedas have not come from the human mind. What does that really mean is a question that we can ask ourselves. And I'll just share with you how I have looked at it and how I've understood this particular epithet that is given to this uh, language and to that knowledge of the Vedas. So uh, the world around us, and we are also essentially made of vibration at various levels. So at a physical level, we are vibratory beings, emotionally, mentally, we are vibratory beings. And we are a, a conglomeration of a, a vibratory package in an environment that is also full of different kinds of, uh, which is a fully different kind of a vibratory field around us. So I wanted to ask you, like, if you, if any of you would like to try and reproduce maybe Chinese for me or Russian for me or anything. So something that you've not maybe studied, but you have heard and it has left an impression in your mind. Can you try and reproduce something for me, please? Like I said, it can be Chinese or Russian or Japanese or Chinese. Let me just say, if you if you've not studied Chinese, just to hello. Yes. Um, uh, I know some words of Japanese. I don't want you to reproduce words that you know. I don't want to. I don't want you to tell me a language that you know. That's a different way the mind functions. I'd like you to just reproduce your impression of a language that you've heard but you've never studied. Okay. So. I think uh, 
uh, in Russian, uh, most of the time, instead of the sound t, they use the sound t. Okay, can you just maybe make a con sentence construction? Just, um, it's not a proper sentence, but your impression of a sentence in Russian. So, like, if I said that I ate a uh, uh, tomato soup, uh, sorry, I drink, I drank tomato soup yesterday. So, in Russian, it might sound like I drink tomato soup. Yes, All right. No, what I'd like you to do is actually to reproduce Russian itself, not use English as a Russian would. So, for example, if you just had to tell, you know, just make if I <laughs> make a sentence Chinese. Uh, there are some names which can reveal the country they come from. Uh, so, you know, they have a typically uh, sounding name. So that will no. be... In the exercise, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you. What I'm saying is, we've all heard Chinese. Right. So if I say just reproduce the sounds of the Chinese language, you don't have to know it. <laughs> what would it sound like? Just your impression of it. Not a word you know. So yeah, about Chinese, the Chinese are Chinese have gone pretty heavy on palatals and fricatives. So like Joshua and those sound will be more in that language. Like no, make a sentence for me. Like, like just make Hello? like if somebody says, "What does Chinese sound like?" Make a sound for me. Hello, madam. I'm Sri Ram here. Yes, uh, it would sound something like Shai Chui Te Ta Pai Choka. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, that's what I mean. So Russian, for example, what would Russian sound like? That's what I mean. Whether you understand even, it or not, it's not about general knowledge. It's just about yeah, your... Yeah, yeah, Russian would be something like Siviski of Serbs, Perfect. Perfect. You've demonstrated my point. So what happens is, basically that we have, when we hear... <laughs> when you've heard a certain language, that language, the sounds of that language have left an impression in the mind without your thinking about it. This system reproduces those sounds in a particular manner. Okay. Now, the body, without thinking about it, huh, because there is no training around it, is reproducing the sounds the way it thinks the tongue should touch, etc. Well, there's no mind involved. It's a direct hearing to a verbal transmission. Now, what happened is, when the Vedic rishis in the heights of their meditation had certain questions about fundamental questions of existence, who am I, where am I going, etc., etc., they allowed the sounds of the universe to impact them in a particular manner and without any, uh, uh, without any distortion of their human system because through the process of meditation, they had quietened their being. So without any disturbance of their human system, they reproduced certain sounds which came out in the form of the Sanskrit language in this context. But what we find is that the sounds that came out had a very beautiful mapping on the human vocal system, a certain kind of a perfection, which is very hard for the human mind to have evolved. And therefore, this could be one of the reasons why the origins of the Sanskrit language and the Vedas is attributed to an apaurusheyatvam. That means that which is not created by the human mind, but which has been received through a revelation. But uh, as we go down, you will understand that the nature of this perfection is multi-layered, multi-dimensional, and therefore also the attribution to it as a perfect sound. Any language, when we talk of language, it has certain components. So there are sounds, there are words. Though, so the sounds put together form words, those words put together form sentences, those sentences put together form the content. And at different stages, there are different parts that in, are introduced. So I'll just show you this particular chart here, which I had used in a course. Uh, I, I know it's, it's, it's uh, maybe, you know, something that there's a lot of Devanagari. I don't expect you to know that, but I'll just take you through that. So basically, there is something like Varna or the sounds of the language. Those come together to form the padas or the words. The words can be largely categorized into noun verbs, so nominal verbs, uh, words, 
verbal uh, roots roots then what happens there so the root is known as dhatu you can see my cursor right so there is there are certain amazing features about the verb also and we'll see as we go down but this is just to show you that every verb has two aspects there is a fruit to a verb and there is a, a process to it every verb has to have that and we'll see how that becomes fantastic later on then each verb is divided into 10 groups uh when we talk of you know engaging with sanskrit its rewards and challenges this sort of starts becoming a little of the challenge part of it because it can seem like there is so much of detailing into this language huh? and there are like i won't go into this too much but largely to know that the words break up into nouns and verbs the verbs have their own characteristics nouns have their own characteristics and all of that form this complex grammar of the sanskrit language and uh, this is another elaboration of that i'll come to it when we talk of sanskrit there is a lot of this precision in the sanskrit language so what is this science of sanskrit is something i'll try and show you and also in my experience i have realized that sanskrit is a language that really helps to promote first principle thinking what do we mean by first principle thinking when any idea or any word is broken up into its smallest component perfectly analyzed and then you build it up again and you get a more detailed picture of the larger whole so what happens with sanskrit so the sounds of the sanskrit language are uh, largely there is the alphabet and there is also the maheshwara sutras so this is the arrangement of the sanskrit letters there are five places of pronunciation i'll show it to you here so you've got the gutturals or the kantya you've got the palatals or the talavya the cerebrals or the murdhanya the dentals or the dantya and the oshtya or the labials all right so we see that there are these different five places of pronunciation which means that the human vocal system has been very neatly divided the range of the human vocal system has been very neatly divided into five parts benefits and challenges of that benefits of that i will share with you and each of the sounds has been assigned these different places so by the utterance of them one is actually doing a very systematic stimulation of the different parts of the human vocal system and this stimulation of the different vocal system parts of the vocal system has certain benefits in terms of how it can then stimulate those parts in the brain there are corresponding parts in the brain that it stimulates and what can be the impact of that on the human body so for example in the english language there is no t sound it only is a t which is neither a murdhanya neither a cerebral sound nor is it a soft sound it is somewhere there now somebody who speaks only in english will never have the stimulation of the soft ts and the ds ds can be there but the soft ts never there what is the consequence of that is something that we need to think about all right but and then for example uh, if somebody spoke only french or italian or spanish uh, who do, they don't have the t t d these hard sounds don't exist so what does that imply in terms of the impact it has in the stimulation on the brain and on the physiology questions that can be asked but when we look at the arrangement of sounds in the human vocal system we see that you have the short the vowels in the beginning have the short long and the triple long so a a e a see there is a recognition of the experiential impact of the short sound long sound and the very long sound every vowel uh, the first few vowels that we have so a a so the a vowel itself has 18 variations so basically there have been a lot of shades that have been derived or that that have been acknowledged around the pronunciation of these vowels etc i'll not get into too much more elaboration on that but when we are looking at the when we are looking at the consonants we see that there's a very systematic arrangement of the sounds not so we have k which is a k it's a throat sound so k uh, so there's a touch sound and the second one is a touch sound breath k g is a sound touch g and then the next one is a sound touch breath g and then there is a nasal so there is a certain logic so even if you don't remember the 
sounds that are there let's say you've learned the alphabet for the first time and you don't really remember the sounds but if you remember the logic of the arrangement of the sounds the mechanics of the sound production one can almost find the places of the sounds again one can find the alphabet again recreate it so here we see that all the guttural so ka ka ga 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 in the throat cha cha ja ja nya in the palate ta ta da da na in the murda ta ta da da na in the dental pa pa ba ba ma in the lips it follows the order in which sound comes out of the vocal system in a very systematic manner then you've got ya ra la va the sound comes back into the human system and then you've got sh sh s uh, again the sound starts coming out so if one just recites the sanskrit alphabet it is a very systematic simulation of the entire vocal system like i said it's a very systematic simulation and that has its benefits in many ways so this we can see is the mapping of the order of the sanskrit letters onto the chakra system the science of the tantra looks at the subtle level of the human body it looks from the gross to the subtle and it says that when we are producing these sounds we are also stimulating different chakras of the human body so all the 16 vowels are in the throat the next 12 are in the heart center the next 10 are in the manipura the next 6 are in the swadishthana the last 4 are in the muladhara and then the last two letters are up in the ajnya so when one says the sanskrit alphabet one is literally screwing down if i may use that term there screwing down the chakra system and the last two being a push back to the ajnya so it is a stimulation of the entire energy circuit of the human being and bringing it back and awakening into the ajnya chakra because these chakras are connected to the stimulation of the human body in different ways and the human human energy systems so we see that when we talk of the precision of sounds and mantras etc it is not just about uh, you know a certain cultural uh, you know uh, uh, rigidity around correctness but it is because there is a chakra networking a chakra circuiting that goes wrong so instead of shanti you see ta is here it's in the manipura somebody says shanti which is in the anahata the entire circuiting is different and therefore the effect of that is very different huh? so this these are some very interesting uh, relations and when we study uh, astrology the different planets there are certain readings where they say that different planets are assigned different letters so an utterance of these sounds uh, because somewhere they were received from the environment from the universe itself there is a certain correlation at various levels that takes place and as prabhaji was also mentioning in this letter in this language every sound that is uttered requires us to be conscious of how much of breath am i putting into it whether i'm saying kal or khal um makes a difference and sometimes it might not even make sense or if i say himalaya which is what one tends a mistake one tends to make because you're looking at a's in the english roman script one a can be a you know it can be a short one a long one there is no distinct wishing between them so himalaya doesn't mean anything but if you say himalaya it means something because it's hima snow alaya abode so when you put it together it becomes himalaya and therefore it has a, a representational meaning of a particular reality um but when you say himalaya it becomes utilitarian the meaning is understood but it doesn't give more insights into what does that word really mean so the pronunciation plays starts playing an important role because it can change the meaning of the word that we are uttering and wanting to communicate so kala and kala if i misplace the long vowel kala means time kala means art or it can mean another frame of time also it's very interesting but yeah so how we are using our vowels or the awareness of the length of the vowel the breath behind the consonant these are things that in different ways help to regulate the pranic movement within the individual itself so this the manner in which the sound is moved in the human body 
uh, and the pranas impacted by them can play a very significant role in how the mind is also impacted. In fact, there is a very interesting YouTube uh, TED talk by somebody called Anthony Metvier in Australia, who has a, he says, he talks about how he used to suffer from a very, very restless mind. And he says that he met his mentor who then um, told him about, you know, just reciting of certain Sanskrit verses. And he said, I just kept mechanically reciting them, reciting them. And one fine day I experienced this complete blank mind, whether you understood it or not, but just the very fact of having recited these sounds had a certain impact on the body and thereby on the mind. So there are certain Buddhist practices <laughs> where they say that by, um, by reciting the Sanskrit alphabet, one can maintain good health because it is at a very subtle level, a head to, to a bottom up. <laughs> it is a bottom up exercise of the being directly indirectly etc so we've just looked at the sound systems and we see how beautifully the arrangement of these sounds have been made <laughs> and the multi-dimensional impact they have there's another part of this that i would like to quickly just show you there's so much to say about the sanskrit language i tell you so I'll just try and show you. I did this exercise recently with somebody and this was a fascinating discovery for me itself. <laughs> so let's take a word like Bala. I'll do it in English. I'll write it in Sanskrit because it's easier to understand, to break it up. Okay. Bala. Okay, now what happens with this? So what are the compositions when we talked about the sounds being actually, you know, small uh, a composition of uh, letters. So what are all these? So you can literally break this down, deconstruct it to its smallest bits. So this is a combination of B. Plus the vowel A. plus the consonant L, the consonant L. Oh, this is really how it is composed, plus the vowel A. Uh. Okay. Now, what is happening? So we are thinking, okay, it's a very simple thing. B plus A plus L plus A, Balo. You know, what's so fantastic about this? What you realize is that in order to say B, there is a very detailed description of the mechanics of the sound production. So this is first and foremost, it's a, it's a consonant, it's a labial consonant. It's a labial consonant. Uh, it is a voiced consonant. Okay. And the A, A is a guttural vowel. So first of all, this is a consonant. I'll, sorry, one second. Can you see this? I'll write it more clearly here. So it's a consonant. Mm. So this is a consonant. It is a labial consonant. It is a it is a voiced consonant. Okay, and there is no breath. No breath. Okay. What happens to R? R is a, it's a vowel. It's a vowel. It's a long vowel. It's a two beat long vowel. You have the option of three also. It's a long vowel. It's a guttural vowel. It is also a, it's a, you know, it's on a particular note. So there is a concept of a note. It's non-nasal, et cetera, et cetera. Non-nasal and it's a, a, 
anudatta when it's 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 not it's on a particular tone you have to take into consideration the tone similarly with la so this is for this with la you say it is a consonant it's a semi vowel it is what else is it it's a semi vowel place of pronunciation is the dental it is a, a semi vowel non dental and it is no breath okay and then a is a vowel it's a short vowel short vowel it's a guttural etc etc now why am i telling you this because in order to produce the sound vowel there is a lot of cognitive working that has happened the mind has had to make decisions first of all most where am i what is the nature of it is it a touch is it a non touch is it a consonant is it a vowel the decision has to be made next where am i going to touch it from next is it going to be a voice is it going to be unvoiced is it going to be a touch sound or sound touch i have to decide next does it have a breath or no breath so just to make the sound b very very fast the mind has to do this has to process all these decisions so you see that in order just to say this word bala the mind has made at least 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 9 10 11 12 13 14 15 16 17 18 around 20 decisions the mind has had to make very very quickly in order to produce the sound bala and this is a cognitive process but a very subconsciously fast kind of a movement that has happened so in sanskrit for every single utterance the mind has to engage in this decision making at a very very fast pace and here we've not even not even gone into the grammar part of it we've only talked about the pronunciation of the root word called bala then there is a the whole grammar part of it will it be a subject will it be a object is it a... so if it is a subject you will say bala this will then tell you acha this part will tell you that this is a masculine word it is a singular word it is a um, it is a word that ends with an akara so it's an a ending word uh, then it will tell you that this is a, a masculine i'll say singular then this is a subject so many pieces of information are embedded in those two dots there and that is when it's just an embedding of two dots there but the fact is that it actually is a processing for the mind to make a decision about how am i going to use that word in my sentence and this is something that allows the mind to become more and more sharp because with every word that is uttered the mind has to do this processing extremely fast and that is one of the things that results in creating the mind and making the mind a uh, sharp and very precise in its articulations okay so if that degree of awareness is not there in the mind then there can be slips like instead of bala people say bhala it's a common error that where there should not be a breath one hears a breath that is happening because the consciousness of the individual is not paying 100% attention to all the precise dimensions of this language this paying attention to all the precise dimensions of the language is what i believe not just the nature of the sanskrit language but engaging with a language which has this degree of perfection and precision also results in the fine tuning and sharpening of the human instrument and uh, makes it more and more uh, alert to the nuances of expression okay so when we talked of the apara benefits or the external benefits it is that the human vocal instrument becomes more precise the hearing and the speech mechanism becomes more refined it has to be able to distinguish between bala and bhala so more i'm going to be talking of the teaching the uh, challenges that i face you know when i teach spoken sanskrit and it's very interesting to note i was just teaching a group of americans who were uh, doing ayurveda and we were going through the sanskrit alphabet and something that we take for granted like when i would say a p which is a non aspirated sound one would we take it so much for granted that it's such an easy sound to make but you won't believe how much of difficulty that population had 
in just trying to cut out the breath from the P sound because it was spontaneously a P. Just that ability to master the breath and to say, no, it is a P and not a P. Because there is a P, there's a burst of the aspirated sound, which is a different sound. So these changes are what, uh, you know, the, the subtlety of pronunciation mechanism is what sharpens the human instrument and also uh, uh, results in the uh, fine tuning of the consciousness of the individual who's dealing with it. And as time runs out, I'm also conscious of the fact that uh, there is just so much more to say. I'll take you through them in any case, because then you have the, uh, the Maheshwara Sutras where Panini has rearranged these letters in such a manner that you can create a whole meta language that will then represent, encapsulate all of the Sanskrit grammars with its exceptions, etc., etc. So if somebody says something like an ach, which is the first letter here, well, we can make a uh, and a ch, it implies all the vowels. The entire group of vowels is represented by ach. If somebody says hal, her, I'll show it here, her and a la, it there is a hal that is there which has a different grammatical purpose. But normally when you refer to hal, you understand all the consonants that are there. So using this meta language, he was able to create the entire Panin Ashtadhyayi text of grammar. It is. And this is a, a paper by VPK Peterson, where he says that a math mathematical analysis of Panini Shiva Sutras reveals that this particular rearrangement of the letters into 14 sutras is the is the what do you say is the more minimum uh, permutation and combinational representation that can cover the maximum range of the Sanskrit grammar. So with just 4,000 sutras about, he has captured the entire structure of the Sanskrit language and to a great degree of perfection, uh, it's not absolutely perfect, but to a great degree of perfection, which has allowed uh, the, the language to continue in its format with mu without much change since uh, he created that text. Okay, just coming in, when we have the word formation, we need to think of gender. So this is one place just to show you that in order to make a word, you know, if I'm now getting into grammar and I want to use a word like balaha, I showed you, it is an akaranta pullinga shabda, which means it's a word that ends with a, it's a masculine word, and therefore it will have certain ways in which the word will be declined. Similarly, these are all the possible endings. You can have a kara ending with e, a masculine word that will end with either um, e or e u or u, a or r, all the consonants. Now, depending on what the ending is, it will acquire that kind of a, uh, a declensional transformation or the vibhakti forms will be different. So the mind has to retain those possibilities. And that is the whole memory part of the Sanskrit language where you have to remember those basic formulae. Once those basic formulae have been grasped and retained, it's a one-time investment. So the beauty of the Sanskrit language is it's one-time investment. One-time investment in learning those forms. If you've learned it once, you've learned it for, a, for lives times. It's not only a, a lifetime, lifetime. Why I say that is because the confidence that you can have is that if a word ends with a and is a masculine word, 10th million years from now, if there will be a word that will create, that will end with an a, which will be a masculine word, I know exactly how it will function. There is no anxiety of constant learning. And this we underestimate the reassurance to the learner that this gives. That if I have to engage in a language and I know that my effort is a one-time thorough uh, effort that I have to give engagement with that, then I don't have to constantly stay in this uncertain ground. I mean, I'll just give the example of the English language because it's an easy language due to its you know uh, lack of consistencies in pronunciation, etc. Uh, so you have P-O-R, poor, D-O-R, door, no, uh, M-O-R-E, more. So there is no way that the consciousness can be settled when you're learning this language. If I show you a new English word, 
there is no way that you can say with 100% confidence it will be pronounced in this way. So what we uh, underestimate is how this uncertainty of uh, extrapolation of possibilities can destabilize human consciousness versus the stability of a certain language structure, what it can do to the human consciousness. So I had a friend in Australia who was studying some spoken Sanskrit and he said that when he was learning English, he was dyslexic. He had difficulties in reading words, etc. He then studied Sanskrit where one sound, where one letter represents one sound and having engaged with that for a sufficient long period of time, he found that his problem in dyslexia in English was resolved. And this is the first person's narration on that. So we find how this, the, the engagement with languages that have a steady, uh, you know, a steady format can also create a certain degree of surety and confidence in the learner of that language. Having said this, I have to also add the fact that in Sanskrit, there are, that first part also is extensive, quite extensive. There are certain patterns you can identify, but there are also certain exceptions. So that first investment could be a, a little detailed and heavy investment. And that becomes something that scares people that, oh my God, I have to remember all those tables. But the fact is that there are patterns. So if you learn patterns, it becomes easy. And Sanskrit is a language, when I say it's a spoken language, the more one says, uses the language aloud, the more easily one will grasp the grammar. So we did this, I was, uh, and I'm overlapping with tomorrow's session also a little bit, but I was teaching the spoken Sanskrit to an Australian group. And there was a person from an Aboriginal background or a native background who attended the first day. And, you know, I was teaching certain verbs. So typically some verbs would end with like gachati to go, khadati, he goes. So gachati, he goes or she goes. Khadati, he goes or she, uh, she, he eats or she eats. Pat will become patati, lik, likati. There is an auditory logic of the language that one can start grasping. So this person came on the first two days, heard a little bit, then could not attend and then came towards the end. And just being very present in the class, this person was able to grasp the logic of the language that was being used and even make sentences much to the shock of the others. Because he was so present to the phonetic logic of this language, he was able to literally create sentences, although he had not participated in the entire course. So the spoken aspect of this language allows us to uh, connect to the grammar of this language much more easily. Okay, is my contention and my experience actually. Uh, very quickly, I'll just take you through the words and the fantastic things that words have here. So a word like Hridaya. <laughs> Excuse me. The word Hridaya. Hr means to take away the to give and year means to move. So Hridaya basically tells that which removes our uh, bad blood, the which gives fresh blood and year which makes it circulate. It means the heart. So if I just say heart, which also has a Sanskrit root, Hrit, it doesn't necessarily give us more insights into the function of the thing. When we say Hridaya, we get a better understanding about what that object does. So words in Sanskrit are descriptive of the function of the objects that you're denoting. So if you're studying biology or botany in Sanskrit, the nomenclature of the objects you're studying will actually tell you what that does. Huh? So uh, like Shitopaladi. So Shitopaladi in uh, Sanskrit will tell you that it creates, it, it's a creator of a little bit of uh, coolness, for example, in the system. So things like that. Basically, when we are talking of using nomenclatures of a certain language, it allows us to understand the function. You can have Surya Sahasra Nama, a thousand names for the sun, which shows thousand different functions of the sun, imagine. And that's the other part of it. Sanskrit also is a language where you have Ambuda and Varida. You can have many, many synonyms. And this richness of synonyms also allows the richness of language because you're seeing the different facets <laughs> of language. We are seeing the different facets of a word and what that object can do. So in terms of the mind, it allows a certain creativity to build. 
because you're seeing the different possibilities of application of that particular object. So if I just say sun, I have one understanding of it. If I say dinner, kara, doer of the giver of the morning, bhas, kara, bringer of light, anshumali, one who has rays, um, uh, diva, kara, another word, bringer of light. So many words that you can use to denote the uh, functions of that particular object. Another you can do is you can break up the words, you can go to the roots of the words. So ka ga. Ka meaning space, ga goer. So just by saying ka and ga, we can understand what this object does. It's a space goer. Tends to become, you know, we tend to use it more often to denote a bird, and that's fine. A word for plant is pa the pa. Pa is the feet, pa means drinker, one who drinks from the feet. Uh, and you understand what the plant, how the plant really survives, draws its nutrition. Another important aspect of the Sanskrit words is that they are creators of realities. So when I say Shanti, the sound of the word carries its inherent experience and delivers it to the person who's saying it. So it's not just a creator of images through meaning that you will give to it, but it is also a creator through the inherent potency of the sound of the word itself. So in English, if I say peace, you can think of piece of cake or piece of uh, bread, a uh, piece of mind. You have to look at the spelling. Only the seeing of the spelling will tell you what you really meant. And of course, the context also. But uh, the sound of the word doesn't carry its inner experience necessarily. But in Sanskrit, especially the mantra, mantric Sanskrit carries this inherent power of experiential delivery within the word itself. There are the Sanskrit non-translatables, Dharma, Brahma, Mantra, Yajna, two Brahmas. But the word uh, Brahma, for example, I'll tell, I'll tell the word Dharma very quickly here. So Dharma uh, comes from the concept of a Vedic idea of sat Dharma literally comes from Dhr, to hold. What is it holding? Dharayate iti dharma. What is it upholding? So there is a Vedic idea. And this is the worldview that we start talking about. What does that worldview say? It says that in the universe at any given time, there are optimum, pot uh, there are, what do you say? Uh, optimum possibilities in any given circumstance. Uh, so if you are in a particular circumstance, there will be the sum total of the optimum potentials of each one there. That optimum is what you call satya, beingness or the truth of the moment. That then gets translated into action, ritha, to do the right thing. When you know what is the ideal, translate it into action, ritha, you cannot but have the best consequence, which is brihat. So satyam, ritam, brihat is like a framework for any kind of perfect action. And when you have, when you can see that and uphold that ideal, that becomes the idea of dharma. So dharma is not about religion, duty and all those things. Dharma really implies the upholding of the very best in any given circumstance. Okay. And then, so that's just one word there, but there are just so many words who give us an insight into the psychology of the word itself. Similarly, su ka. Su means excellent, ka means space. Happiness means excellent space. But where? External excellence space or internal excellence space? What does internal excellence space mean? What is the relationship between external excellence space and internal excellence space? A lot of questions. How do we create excellent internal spaces? So I've written a paper on this where you see that sukha becomes a process of self-architecture. How do I manage my space? How do I design my spaces? How do I manage my spaces? The better I manage my internal spaces and promote excellence, the happier I will be because that's the nature of this. That's the nature of the word and the experience. Uh, another fantastic thing about Sanskrit, and this is the hardware of the language, which this is very complex here. It looks complex, but this is the difference between the software, which is the applied part of it, where you have the verb bhu to be. And if something is, you say bhavati happens. But there is a whole hardware behind that that is telling you how did the root bhu become bhavati. And there are at least 25 to 26, 20 steps here, which through Panini's grammar, so bhu, 
with a particular addition will become who lot who lot plus it you know keeps adding minusing things adding 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 until finally you arrive at bhavati so this entire processing here is what panini does and the reason i'm just showing this to you is because when we talk of the extreme precision of the language this is what we are also referring to that in its grammatical structure there is no place which is open to subjective interpretation in that sense of you know if i'm doing a grammar it's all written down and you have to follow that very strictly so the steps that the mind has to go through in order just to arrive from the root bhu to bhavati is that many and you multiply that into many more that loop starts looking very big but that is what sharpens the human intellect to a point that i think very few languages have this degree of detailed uh, processing from so force to application which is there uh, and then just very, yes i know we have about 10 minutes left yes you can continue and we yes. can, we can have questions tomorrow if you yes one just last very quickly i will just say this last one is that you know the, the, when we talk of verbs you also have this creation of the declensions the vibhakti form so we see that you have a verb that says you know the boy goes when you ask all the questions around it then you get clarity on the you know the whole idea you're trying to express and this getting greater clarity on the idea you're trying to express is a very left brain right brain coordination work so the left brain is thinking in language the right brain is building an image the more clearly this coordination is happening the more precisely every word is connected to the other you see the boy goes to school in english you can't when you say school we don't know what that school is doing i have to add the preposition to school from home to make sense of that particular sentence in sanskrit those are embedded into the word itself the preposition is embedded into the word so i'll say schoolam and i do this english sanskrit mix in script so then you have schoolam or math which says it from home and therefore you can every word signifies exactly its meaning in your thought and you can mix and match the order huh? so when you have you see when you say the english sentence you have about 18 words in sanskrit it's about 9 words so brevity is introduced creativity of expression is introduced precision of understanding the relationship of words are introduced many many things happen as a result of this i can uh, sort of stop here where you understand therefore that the psycholinguistics implication of studying sanskrit is that we see that there is an embedded interrelationality or the clarity of relationality interrelation of thought components is embedded and it shows that it promotes first principle thinking and sharpens decision making ability it can help unambiguous categorizing of the world around and within and it has a certain philosophical logic of its linguistic grid uh, that facilitates mental computing needed to form sentences okay so i'll stop here